Oh, yeah. 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 But I have not used it. Would it be possible to use the optical pump capability to investigate the question the gentleman was asking about the mode transmission or mode structure in the grading region? Probably, yeah. Yeah. I would say yes. Yeah.
because all this information you already know. Now you see how it's organized in the <coughs> geo -fuck. So it, this, this is the first vertical uh, uh, region. Now comes polygon. PO2, PO3, PO4, PO5, PO6. All the same thing. Same principle. And at the end, of course, you, you also have to define some matter about it. But in this case, so you define it at in PO1 again. You go from zero to one, and you put two mesh points. So on each side, because it's a one D problem, you just need two mesh points, and that's it. And then you say uh, you generate that mesh file, and this mesh file that can be plotted, and, and you can see how the mesh goes down. So that's a geometry file. Question. No, that's automatic. Uh, done automatically. Yeah, yeah that's all automatic. But you did see uh, when you simulate two D examples, you don't have an influence from this diagonal meshing. Just some numerical problems or some. You don't have problems with this diagonal meshing. Uh, no. Uh, usually, uh, it would. If you look at a rectangle mm -hmm. or. or Geometry like that, it would, it would take the, it would cut the mesh across the angle with largest internal angles. So that that is the uh, optimal for for drift diffusion solver. Uh, yeah, but the user doesn't really see the effect of uh, where to, where to oh, okay. draw this. Okay, the user don't have to decide something about. That's right. That's right. It's automatic done. Okay. Inside.
lines, and all the activation parameters, and this is a very powerful numeric activation. Here, by default, there are only two parameters, but in this command, you can include all your gain calculation options. I will talk about this later. Rating model is almost the same as we had before in the layout file. So all the grading information is also given in the material. You can, yeah, you can you can have both uh, N and P, and uh, the it will compensation is automatically uh, included in the program. Then you just overlay. Yeah, two yeah. Different regions, that, so you put donors, uh, donors in that window, and then accept those. Yeah, on the same window. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. <laughs>
them to a data file instead of to the window, and you will have an ASCII file that you can read into any other plot software. Okay. It can be used for calculation also. Yeah. Or, or, or for post processing. Yeah. Right. It's all ASCII files. Yeah. Game theory. Everything is ASCII. This depends on uh, refractive index of concentration parameters in macro files, material files, uh, how it is calculated, from where, from where is taken dependence of refractive index on concentration? But there is an internal model, maybe it's Simon, you can yeah. How is it calculated? Oh yeah, it's um, the index change as a function of a carry density uh, model, it's, uh, it's calculated for the uh, active region. Uh, 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 it's the same way as you calculate the, uh, the optical gain. It's the major part of the optical, uh, like uh, it's what's the, it's the Kramer, Kramer, uh, Kramer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
multi-mode controls the multi-mode option, so by default it only takes a fundamental mode, but it can uh, take up to nine different modes and, and calculate the mode competition for nine different modes. Okay, this is the optical part, the XY optical part. Now comes some uh, parameter for the, the transport equation. These are numerical parameters of tolerance and at maximum iteration and damping steps. Normally, you don't have to play with these parameters. The default settings are pretty robust. If the program crashes, most of the time, something is wrong with the physical design of the device, and not with these numerical settings. Question? No, so that one. This is only one. Yeah. Frequency, I mean. Longitudinal mode. Did the program, can the program deal with this different, hmm, for prefero modes? Different longitudinal modes. It picks one longitudinal mode, right? Only one. It cannot deal with different modes. Uh, you mean lateral or longitudinal? Longitudinal. Oh, yes, yes. There are, there are multiple longitudinal modes. But if you plot the spectrum, you plus spectrum. But you it receive. considers many modes, longitudinal modes. Yeah, many longitudinal okay. modes. Yeah. yeah exactly. But uh, this number. It this is, is lateral mode. This only lateral. This is lateral mode. mode. Yeah, that and was lateral. Longitudinal it takes automatically. Yes or no? How I can mm, determine how many long longitudinal modes um, take into account? Yeah, in, in the second section in the dot solve, there's, um, in the, there's a statement called the mode search. Basically, the, the, you can search the range of how many modes, how many longitudinal modes you want to be included in the simulation. Uh, yeah, there is another command. In what, the in what section? I will show you at it's the called end. There's the another command search. that controls this. Yeah. Yeah. It's on the next page, actually. We will get that. So, then after you define the numerical parameters, you first calculate the equilibrium solution, yeah, zero voltage, and then you, you calculate the round trip gain uh, versus, and the phase versus wavelengths. At this point, you can put a stop in here and look up your reflectivity spectrum of your DFB, for instance, or your pixel or whatever. Yeah, so you can stop the program here and, and look up these other files I mentioned before, and then, uh, you can define uh, another set of numerical parameters if necessary, sometimes it is not. Uh, the next step is then the voltage scan. As I mentioned before, it first scans the voltage from zero to the band gap voltage of the active region. So that's calculated automatically. Uh, so the program didn't ask for this, it's calculated automatically. And it will run this voltage. Uh, Scan, and then it will switch to a current scan. And, and now comes the tricky point here. It will start a current scan up to a, another current step. Okay, right now you have not turned on the full laser model. This is just electrical simulation. There's no optical processing. So you have, the program has to know at which point it should involve the full laser simulation. That current should be very close to threshold, just below threshold, between transparency and threshold, actually. And this point uh, has to be found. The program has an option to find this point automatically, but I, I experience that often it doesn't work. So I prefer to find it myself. And, and, uh, and this is, so you scan the current up to that point between transparency and threshold, and after you have done that, then you activate the full uh, solver of the program. Like here, this is then the scan 3D command. This starts the full thing. The full self consistent simulation is start started with this command. And then you define just the current range. You start with this uh, current between transparency and social, and you go to some upper current as far as you want and you define the number of points you want to have along this line. I will uh, go, come back to that tuning later. But 
So at the end of the of the file, there is information on the longitudinal mode. So, so this says log, this longitudinal is a command, and you have again you have to say the reference wavelength this time in meter. You would say light, uh, left and right reflectivity. You would tell what the section length is, the number of mesh points, and now comes this mode search command where you have control over how many longitudinal modes you want to take with you. Yeah, so these are not all the options. There are much more options for mode search, but all other options are used with their default parameters typically. And, and then it's another bias 3D uh, command that uh, is also uh, uh, controls the longitudinal solver. So this, this is read at the end, but that doesn't mean it is done later than the other stuff. So it's in, all the information is right in the beginning and it's, the, the program knows all this. Questions? Maybe it's a little bit confusing. That's why I want to go through this tuning procedure, especially the big file here. Yeah. So after, so now I tell you how to find this critical current where you, where you turn on the actual full simulation. And for this, you stop the program after some initial current scan and, and look up the big file. And the big file tells you input current, output current is the same number, the gain and the wavelengths. So in the gain is critical. Transparency means gain is zero. So when the gain goes from minus to plus, that's the transparency current. So and you as your starting current for the full 3D calculation, you just pick the next <coughs> first current that has a positive gain. That's your starting point. And as I said, the program can do it automatically, but some, if, you, if you manipulate any of your files, the gain or the SOL file, it will not work. It can only uh, work with like virgin files that you have not manipulated. Then it can find this point automatically. But later on, if you play with the SRL file, you have to do it yourself. Because the reason is that the program has to know what has to actually edit your SRL file. And if you have you have changed your SRL file, the program doesn't know about these changes. Yeah, then it will actually delete all your changes and, and put in place the old SRL. This is a little bit messy in Pix 3D, but it's, it, it's worthwhile to look at these things carefully uh, to stabilize the simulation. Of, of these preparations you should do before you go home and, and let the program run uh, overnight or something and do the full simulation to make sure that it really runs. In last step, this is not required. Last step, you don't have to do this. Last step will find this current automatically. So questions? So far we're almost through with these files. Here you, you, you deal with one reflectivity for all modes, but in fact the, the reflectivity is different for different modes. Different uh, lateral or lateral modes? Yeah. Lateral mode. No, no, uh, you, only the same right now for this version. But if actually the program knows what the effective index is, the program knows on the other side is air, so the program could adjust the reflectivity. Principle possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's possible, but right now in this version, sure. uh, it will it will use the same numbers still. So some yeah. future edition will yeah. do that. Yeah. Okay. Make a list. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, then, twenty minutes later, or two hours later, or next morning, you have your full simulation finished. And now you want to plot your results. Uh, 
it's a, the plot file is all just set up, it's a setup routine, setup POT file, and it, it asks you just simply what you want to plot, at what data point at the end or somewhere in the middle, at every bias point you can plot all the information, it's all there. Then you define the type of the laser, and then variables in the XY plane you want to plot, variables in the Z direction you want to plot, and so you have all the options here, but there are more options than actually listed here. You can uh, later uh, go to the reference menu and see what other plot options you have. In principle, you can plot every parameter that the program knows you can also plot, almost every parameter. And this is how the plot file looks. So you start with defining where you want the plot to go, to the window or the data file or the postcard file, whatever you want to generate. Sometimes the default setting is not window, it's postcard, then you wait and wait and no window shows up, then look for a postcard file. And, uh, or you just edit this and put window instead of postcard. Then you will see a window. Then it, it tells you what, uh, it asks for the names of the output files, what data set, and what data set you want to plot. Normally you have by default there are 10 data sets, so 10 is the maximum term. Then it does an L plot. L plot is a line plot, just any cut line across your device, and it will plot any variable. Band means band diagram. I can actually show you right now. So the first line is an L plot of the band diagram from the xy to 0 0.10 to xy 0.1. 2.8. So across the entire device, you do a plot of the band diagram, and what you get is this. Maybe we can make sure the laptop doesn't really have right now. Okay. So this is the plot of the band diagram from the xy to the xy point 0.1 to xy point 2.8. That's the plot of the band diagram. You see. Valence band edge, conduction band edge, quasi Fermi levels, uh, active region is a bulk active region, waveguide region, in your phosphor. So that's your band diagram. Then you can plot a vector plot, like the total current, but in a 1D structure it's pointless to plot the total current. So I, this is a V plot, it's a so called vector plot in a certain window. You can do a contour plot. I don't have an example for that here, but you know what a contour plot is of the wave intensity. You can plot a surface plot, S plot of the wave intensity. That is what we see here. It's actually, this is a vertical cut through the device, and this is a longitudinal direction, Z direction. And in Z direction, you have a wave traveling to the left and a wave traveling to the right, so you can plot Either one of them, in this case, it is a wave traveling to the right from 0 to 500. That's a device length. Yeah. So, and since we have a DFB structure, we have such a longitudinal intensity distribution. But on top of this, you have the other wave traveling to the right, to the left, that has something like this, and the total wave can also be plotted. And so these are uh, like x, y, z plots can do, and then comes another set of plots. Plot Z, you can say you want to plot the wave traveling to the right, the wave traveling to the left. That is just a 1D version of what, what we have just seen, just the line. Then you can plot the power coming out of the left facet, the power coming out of the right facet versus bias, and this is the upper curve. Now this is the Li curve, yeah. power right, power left. Then you can plot the mode spectrum, that is this curve, that's the mode spectrum of the DFB. And, that's good. and, and there are many other options, but you get the idea that uh, how, how the plotting works is, is pretty simple. And actually when you generate the plot file, it, it will always have a list of all the other options that you can use. You can simply copy and paste any of the other things up here in the activator. 
And this is just the beginning of the list. And this is all the other plot options. So I don't want to go through that for time being. But the, these are all the plot options you have. The reference manual tells you more about that. OK, question? Oh yeah, this is this is option. This is option that you uh, that you use the uh, your own the light enhancement factor. Then you will calculate the index change according to your uh, light enhancement factor. Yeah, okay. So that's in the index the statement called the index model. So you can choose to enter your own the light enhancement factor. Then it will switch off the automatic uh, calculation for the index change. I mean, you use that. Use what you want. Also, certain index change. Yeah, yeah. So this is an option. You can do that, and then you can plot the index change as a function of um, uh, a function of uh, distance uh, for x and y. Once you've done that, yeah. There's an example uh, 
you can have both laden together, completing it. Then you can do polarization switching. So just wait one more month. <laughs> <laughs> so then the ordering model for the gain is by default a Lorentzian ordering model, but you can also use Landsberg or other models. Asada model, there are several options. Whatever you believe in, you can use here, and you can also change the parameters of these models. Then I have made green dots on the very important commands that, that I normally put in, in addition to the default settings. So one of this is a, is a valence, valence mixing that will include the interaction of heavy hole and light hole band. And uh, what the program normally does, it uses the KP method, the 4x4 KP method, to, to get that non-parabolic uh, band structure, but then it fits this with the parabola to go back to the effective mass procedure. If you don't want this, if you really want to use the full KP thing, the program can, can do it, but everything will slow down. Then you have to say high order KP. Yes, by default it's no. Uh, and that will uh, tell the program to fit the, the band structure with a high order polynomial. So you use the actual result of the KP. A band structure calculation. So uh, it's up, it takes much longer, but it's more accurate. So for the physicist among you, that is the way to go. But it takes more time. Then you can use the actual approximation. So I wouldn't have to go too deep into the uh, band structure thing now, but the expert would know what that is. You can refine the search <laughs> if you have many levels of white band quantum well with very levels very close, you can search for the levels more, uh, with, with smaller steps. The analytical recombination, uh, in a quantum world, the, the spontaneous recombination is automatically used. Yeah? With the spontaneous recombination spectrum is integrated to get your B parameter, to get the spontaneous recombination rate. Only in bulk layers that B is used that you define in the macro. In the quantum world, it is always the, the actual spontaneous emission curve, but you can change that. You <coughs> can say here you don't want that, you want the B parameter. Right? That's still the same, still active. Yeah. Yeah. Override area is a command that I hardly use. It's uh, sometimes the program, if you define in the barrier, in the bulk barrier macro, different parameters than in the quantum well macro, the question is which parameters the program takes. And the, the, this program, this command controls this. But for me, it was not important. Exchange coefficient uh, controls the band gap renormalization with high carrier density. Uh, the program uses an analytical <laughs> model that with a uh, uh, cube root of the carrier density, uh, so the, the delta E is the change of the band gap is proportional to the third root of the carrier density, times a factor, and this factor is the exchange coefficient here. 
And so by default, as a zero, if you want to have banned up renormalization activated, this has to be non-zero. Then you put in the number you like. So the scheduling time is the default scheduling time, 0.2 picoseconds here. But if you use the tau model, then the scattering time will be calculated automatically. And you don't have to put that in. A scattering is, is some other parameter in, in one of these broadening models. Thickness of the quantum wall is clear. N chiros, P chiros, this is <coughs> so, so, the, the free carrier absorption is roughly proportional to the carrier density. The absorption coefficient is proportional to the carrier density. And this is a factor, the proportionality factor. And uh, by default, it is zero. But for instance, in long wavelength lasers, you have intervalence band absorption, things like this, which goes with, which scales with the carrier density. So I, this P carrier loss can be a very important parameter. And I actually use that as a fit parameter very often, because you never know how accurate your gain model whether you really calculate the real gain in your device. So you need some way of tuning. And uh, the, the gain is roughly proportional to the carrier density, and so is this absorption parameter. So by using this as a fit parameter, you also uh, calibrate a little bit the gain. So, so to say, if your gain is too high in your model, then you need a little bit higher absorption here to get the correct threshold curve to fit your curve. So this is not just a pure intervalence band parameter, uh, absorption parameter. It's also a correction parameter for the gain. That's how I use it, and I find it pretty uh, convenient to do that. So this is a, a factor, dip factor is a factor in front of the dipole moment. You can scale that. The K range is a range in K space that is actually used to fit the parabola through your KP band structure. So you can you can print that KP, KP band structure and see how good the fit is. So the, the plot will show you and then adjust the K range to ma make it closer. I also do that on a regular basis to have a good fit of the actual KP band structure. Uh, <coughs> these two parameters are part of these models here. I, I don't use them normally. Active loss is a background absorption in the quantum wall. If you have like photon scattering losses due to interface roughness that do not depend on the carrier density, you use this active loss parameter. It's a one over centimeter, a one over meter parameter for a background loss in the active region. A, B over A is the ratio with for the deformation potential is the part that goes into the valence band offset. And AC would be the rest of it, goes into the conduction band offset. Material is a material number. QW print is something very nice. If it is one, you don't really see what the program does internally. But if you say two, you get a, a printout that gives you all the quantum parameters that the program uses internally that come from all your settings. So I normally do that to study what the energy levels is. You find exactly what the energy levels are in such things. And the matrix element of all, all this. And this is a maximum number for levels, uh, for quantum world levels you want to search. Questions? Uh, if you use higher order KP, then do we need to change KV? Then what? If you use higher order KP, then yeah. you use k you don't need this? Because this is... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. so, I will skip the next two pages. And uh, actually, I have now... The next two pages show that the gains are... That many I have to speed up a little bit. So I just mentioned here. So you see uh, all the quantum parameters, the band here, the electron mass, the whole mass.
So this is a device structure we have investigated. It's a typical 1.55 coupled per O laser with six quantum wells here. With, and when you plot the bands diagram, you actually see light holes and heavy holes. So you see what's this, what kind of strain you have in your layers uh, and so on. So it's a wide area uh, laser. and uh, a rich waveband laser with this quantum. So nothing fancy. We had certain things we wanted to do with this laser, but I don't go into this. Uh, the question we ended up solving is, next please. sensitivity of these lasers. From the very beginning, uh, we found that with higher temperature, the threshold current goes up exponentially, and the slope efficiency goes down exponentially. And we don't like that, and it's, it's important to know why that happens. And in the literature, normally people, experimental investigations stop at the t naughts. You find out the fit parameter t naught. And that's it, you don't know what physics is behind that you know what to do about it. And there are many papers that propose different mechanisms for that temperature dependent. And um, so some people say it is Auger recombination that kills the laser at high temperature. Other papers said intervalence when absorption, then the temperature sensitivity of the optical gain, the thermionic electron emission emission, so the leakage current to the rich, lateral carrier spreading, passive layer recombination, passive layer absorption. Uh, Seiki from NTT in Japan published a bunch of papers saying there's an overflow of carriers into the waveguide layer kills the laser because that increases the absorption and the laser will stop laser. And of course self-heating. Yeah. But so why is there so much controversy? Everybody believes in this theory. 
The simple reason is, all these people have done great well, but they have not used a self-consistent model that includes all of the options at the same time. So these people have used, they have, sometimes they have a great gain model. So they do some fitting, they find out, okay, gain is a bad guy. But some others have a good leakage model for leakage currents. They do some fitting, find out leakage is a bad guy. Yeah? But to really find out, all these answers are possible. We cannot tell. Yeah? To find out the real bad guy, we have to include all of them self-consistently in one simulation, then do the fit to the measurement, and then we will know. And that's what we have done with PIX3D. So, two more, one more. So, we have just done our experimental homework. Uh, so, this is a threshold current versus temperature. This is the slope efficiency versus temperature. This is the T0 uh, and the T1 for both parameters. Next one. Yeah, and then we, we use PIX3D to find agreement with the measurement. And three months later, we did have agreement with the measurements after some parameter tuning. Yeah. So I have listed here the critical material parameters. And everybody can imagine what that is. First of all, the Auger coefficient that the program is using. So we introduce the temperature dependence. You can put that right into the Markov file, the exponential temperature dependence with an activation energy as reported in the literature. And we just fitted that C0. And we ended up with a value that is very reasonable within the range of numbers reported. Then the next fit parameter was an intervalence band absorption. So it's a K sub P times coal concentration. And we ended up with, with this number, 82. So normally in bulk material, you say this number should be like 24 or so. For quantum worlds, nobody really knows. There are hardly good measurements of water. But this, as I mentioned before, this is kind of a fit parameter to also compensate for, for the case that the gain is too, maybe too high. So this is a pure fit parameter. Not pure, but it's both. It's an absor actual absorption plus fit. But what is in agreement very well with the theory that this parameter doesn't change much with temperature. And that is totally in agreement with theoretical calculations. What changes with temperature is that P, not the intervalence band absorption, just the carrier set up there. And then we have also played with the band offset, but we ended up to use uh, the default number that's in the program. Okay, here, now after we have this fit, we can actually study the physics in the device. We have done more fits than that. We have varied the length of the laser. We have looked at the IV curve. All this was published last year in March in Journal of Quantum Electronics, so you can download that from our page. But, so when we now split up the current in its different contributions, then we have stimulated the combination spontaneous Auger shocky report, uh, vertical leakage, escape current, and lateral spreading current. You don't see it that well here, but in your hand or you will. So this is a, a, a surface plot of the carrier concentration. You see the six quantum worlds in basically in this whole window of the device. And you see that in this region, the carriers diffuse away. So you have a declining carrier density. This is considered lateral leakage current. And the electrons jumping out of the P side into the indium phosphide bridge are considered vertical leakage. So, and now we can really study physics with the software. So we have special current versus temperature. This is a fit, the measurement, and the, and the simulation in black. And now we can split up in Auger, spontaneous recombination, lateral leakage, Effect recombination and vertical leakage. And we see that Auger recombination dominates up to about uh, 80 or 90 degrees, and then the vertical leakage comes in very strongly. And basically, that was known experimentally because at, at a critical temperature, the T naught changes. 
from like 4050 to 20. And so we know there's some other physics going on. And now uh, this shows exactly what's happening. Next one. <coughs> so this is the leakage current. So we can use that Richardson formula for the leakage current. And, and here you see the carrier density and the waveguide region for different temperatures. So with higher temperature, the carrier density in the quantum world goes up, and so does the carrier density in all other layers. But also, the leakage term is directly dependent on the temperature as well. And the leakage, the leakage term, I mean, is the leakage out of the waveguide into the linear force field. So this leakage term. Next one. The question is, why does the carrier density go up? Yeah. The leakage only increases because carrier density goes up. But why does the carrier density go up? And we see the reason here. Because the gain spectrum is shown here for different temperatures, and the gain, the maximum gain, goes down. This is a fabric Pivot laser, so we always sit on top. But the gain goes down because of smaller Fermi spreading. So carriers at each level are just less uh, smaller carrier density. And that means to satisfy a certain threshold gain, we have to pump harder. So we have to put in more and more carriers. Uh, so this gain reduction as function of temperature triggers the increase in carrier density with higher temperature. And this then triggers all the other bad things, OG recombination and leakage. So, but at the heart of the process is the temperature dependent of the gain. Yeah, and the other leakage mechanism only amplifies that uh, effect. Next one, please. And to prove that, we see here a simulation where we can turn off and on separate mechanisms in the model. So this is again the special converse temperature, the, the full curve, uh, full, and then we have this curve where we keep the gain constant. So the gain doesn't change. We just don't tell the gain that the whole thing gets hot. We keep the gain at 20 degrees. And you see with constant gain, the T0 goes from 55 to 188, so almost no temperature sensitivity. Now we have also done some other things, but I skip that now. Next one. So now we want to look at the, uh, that overflow effect. So the internal absorption. This is the total internal absorption, the alpha is function of temperature, and we can find out uh, what the contributions are. So inside the quantum world, is, has the quantum world themselves, they have the highest carrier concentration, so they have the highest contribution to the internal absorption. Then comes some background contribution from the indium phosphide, because our doping offset was not too uh, big enough, so uh, the wave, the optical wave, penetrates into the p-doped indium phosphide region, and that causes some background doping here. And uh, but and this is a contribution from all the passive layers. So that was a theory from from NTT from that group uh, that this actually kills the laser, but this is not true as we show here. It, it, it does go up, but it is never a dominating effect. Next one. Okay, that was a quick example from real life. And now, any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, can I calculate the various different amount of the branches? Is the program getting this or you have to? No, I, at that time I had to extract that by hand. Now the problem is a little bit better. It gives you the alpha i as function of temperature, right? The internal loss, <coughs> it's the actual internal loss. In the past it was the net loss, gain and loss together. Now from the log file you can extract the alpha i. But these numbers are actually, I, I extracted profiles and did integrations over those profiles by myself. So the program didn't tell you the separation. But you can all, you have all the results as ASCII files, so you can do post-processing and find out those things. More questions? Vertical leakage, yeah. Yeah, what I do to find out vertical leakage, normally I plot a profile. I 
plots the, the density of the electron current in vertical direction. And normally what you see is versus y that the electrons go into the quantum world with a strong current and then this current goes down to zero. If you have or to a very small number. If you have leakage, it doesn't go completely down to zero. So actually this current beyond the quantum world, the P dot region is my leakage current. So it's, it's, a, it's a current that, that doesn't go into the quantum world. The current, electron current that leaves the quantum world is my leakage current. You can plot that. Also in a, in a natural buffer. And to ask for a physical implementation, you see, is it just the electrons that don't enter the quantum world fly across the quantum world? No. no, actually, there is no ballistic transport in, in oh, fixed 3D. There. So okay. all the electrons have to go first into the quantum world and then jump out by thermionic emission and leave the quantum oh, okay. world. And Mark Halbertson, the first speaker tomorrow, yeah. he has investigated exactly that question. So what do the electron actually do? Do they fly through or do they first go into okay. the quantum world with his model? And he concluded that they do go first into the quantum world and don't fly through. But you, we can argue about that tomorrow. OK, now the laptop or the projector doesn't help much. Example I want to talk about it. Uh, talk about today is uh, one of the uh, example library, and uh, it studies the difference between uh, a one D situation of a pixel with just a ring contact and and a pillar structure where you actually the difference is that in this pillar structure you have lateral spreading curve, and this lateral spreading curve can be. A, a, a large part of your threshold, especially in these newer pixels that have oxide layers. So you can make very small oxide apertures, but underneath the aperture, the current spreads, and that gives you some current loss. And so the oxide aperture is not uh, included in this example, but it can be included in, uh, in principle in X2D. So, and what is new here with the pixel is basically only the vertical optical part. So in a pixel, you have basically five sections optically. You have a bottom DBR, you have the bottom spacer between active and DBR, you have the active region, the top spacer, and the top DBR. Five different sections. And these optical sections have different properties, and the program ask you for these properties. So when you, you can run the setup routine again with the dialogue, it will ask you for like reflected index steps and all these things. And, I will. and what comes out is a layer file like this. I have simplified that layer <coughs> file a little bit, and I will also show you how to introduce a second column. This is now for the 2D case. So we start with the first column, the center column, next to the axis, seven point 
five micron wide, five mesh points, not scaled, and an extra point on the side. And then comes the second column where the spreading current goes, and this is column number two, same thickness, same radius, uh, six mesh points and the scaling so that the mesh density uh, uh, decreases towards uh, away from the axis. So th this is, as I said before, you just repeat almost the same command and, and with a different column number. So the bottom contact, you start at the bottom, defining the pixel. There was a problem in the past that you should not start with a substrate, you should start with a bottom DBR. But I guess this has been resolved. If you want to have a substrate first in, in thermal simulations, then you can do it. But in the beginning, there was some instability here. So the bottom contact goes through, so it's over the whole distance from 0 to 75, from 0 to 75. It's both the same contact, contact number one. Then comes the bottom. DBR, the end dope DBR, it's algas DBR, and uh, first you need to tell all the optical properties, and this is done by this new command pixel section, and this new command goes into this new file type dot pixel. Yeah, all these pixel section commands go into that when the layer file is processed, and here you have to tell what the name is, just a reference name, any name okay, is good. The mesh points in optical, for the optical mesh, the, what kind of rating you have, so different layers, that would be the layer model. It's not an active region, it has a section loss of 500 per meter, so 5 per centimeter. Then you define layer 1 and layer 2, and it's, layer 1 is all it's always gross direction. So layer one is the bottom layer, layer two is the next. It's, it's important for a pixel design which layer comes first, right? And uh, so layer one is the bottom layer to define a thickness and an index. And that defines your DBR. That's basically your DBR. And in the most recent version, you can also define hybrid DBRs, right? With several different sets of layer pairs. Yeah? Some people want to grow uh, hybrid DBRs, so that, that is possible now. So this is the optical part. In the electrical part, uh, <coughs> you could now type in 40 different layers with all these interfaces and all this. But nowadays, the DBRs, the grating and the interface, all this is that good that you basically have a ohmic resistance, a straight IV curve. So you can simplify this by just using one material, one homogeneous material for the whole DBR and adjusting the resistance or the mobility according to your IV curve. And that's what, what I have done here. So the whole DBR is just one material with an average composition uh, and uh, I can later play with the mobility or with the doping to reproduce a measured IV curve. And that simplifies, that speeds up the calculation very much. Yeah? If that is possible if you can treat the DBR as ohmic resistance, if you have a straight IV curve. If you don't, then there is some thermal emission important, and so then you have to actually put in the layers. You can do that, but it will make the whole thing more complicated and more in stable. So we do that again for both columns. On the, bo the bottom side, the mirror goes through. And when, then we define the total thickness of the entire mirror, the number of mesh points, the scaling, and the doping in that mirror. And we have to use the same name that we produce up here. So this is the DBR section. Now comes the spacer section. So in this space, it's similar. Now we say we use layer zero, that means there is only one layer. Not an active region, a certain section loss. Unfortunately, this cannot be adjusted according to the local carrier density. The section loss is fixed. Maybe in future releases, it would be good to have 
yeah, like in every plane laser, yeah, there's yeah. feedback between higher density and loss. Uh, so, and then the section index, and, and again, here we have one material anyway, so we define this one material, we have a layer thickness and so on, all the other parameters. Then comes a multi-quantum active region, 10 quantum worlds, sky Mars and quantum worlds, as an example. And here, so we define an active region again, we treat this optically as one layer, because the, the layers are so thin, they, they are not really seen by the wave. Yeah, so we can treat this by, as one layer without any internal reflection. Uh, and we can, but we have to say that uh, this is now an active layer, active equals yes, so that the, the optical part of the program knows where, where the gain comes from, comes from this layer. And then we include these, all the well, the definition of the well material and the barrier material is now in some other file. As I indicated before, you can put all this long stack of identical lines into another file and read it again and again and again and up until you have your full 10 quantum worlds included. Then comes the top spacer layer, yeah, same thing as with this, and then comes the, the DBR, the PDBR pillar, pillar, and here it's the same approach, so homogeneous electrical material, but now the only difference is column number one is the semiconductor, Column number two is vacuum, or air. You can say air, you can say vacuum. In both cases, the area will still be meshed. You can also say void, then the area will not be meshed. But if you say void, there are some plotting problems. The plots are some, somehow messed up, so I prefer to use air. Uh, but if you are at the limit of your mesh point, then you can just Excludes that area from being meshed. Okay, then comes the top contact, and here actually, <coughs> that is in the first column, but we don't go from 0 to 7.5, this would be a flat contact. We just introduce a ring contact from 6.5 to 7.5, one micron <coughs> ring contact, so we have a top emitting phase. So that's the whole area for a 2 d <coughs>
So now the SOL file for the Wixer. We are almost done. So it's very similar to what we had before up here. We include the game file, the doping file. Now we have cylinder geometry. So we say cylindrical axis is Y, Y axis, cylinder geometry. The pixel model, uh, this defines um, the lateral, uh, the information that are needed for the lateral mode structure. So the, the vessel function, basically. So it, we need a core index, we need a cladding index. That should actually be very close to this one. Yeah. We need a core radius that was 7.5. We have to say what vessel order we want. That was still the previous version, vessel order zero. Now it can promote competition, so you don't have to define the vessel order. You did, then you, uh, there is no Helmholtz solver here, so zero iteration. Uh, but you have some other settings, a background loss. This background loss is on top of the section loss that you already have defined. So you have to be careful not to add up the losses. Yeah, so you have to decide where you want to define your losses in the sections or as a background loss. Then the initial wavelength and the wavelength range of calculation. Then comes some parameters for the uh, semiconductor transport iteration. Uh, then comes the uh, calculation of the round trip gain and phase. And, and after this, you normally put a stop in and see what you get. And in this case, this is a, the upper graph shows the result. So in the user interface, you can just go to plot, plot round trip gain, then you get this file. And this is a round trip gain, this is basically the reflectivity spectrum of your DBR. And this is a phase information. So whenever the phase goes to zero, you have a mode. The round trip phase is zero. So there is your lasing mode. So the lasing mode sits right here. So that tells you whether you are close to your maximum of the gain. Yeah. If you know from your gain plot that your gain is over here, you will never have lasing. Yeah, so you have to make sure that the lasing mode that you read here sits it's very close to your gain peak. And there are two other modes which have much less reflectivity, which will not lose. And then you can also plot the standing wave. And here's a bug. In this particular example, there's a bug. You see the, the multi quantum well region, also these are the quantum modes, one, two, three, and so on. The, the barriers in between are just too thick, there's 30 nanometers. They're much thicker than typical barriers. So we have several maxima of the standing wave in our thick multi-quantum well region. So in real life, we would design a laser like this because these quantum wells don't do anything. But the program, it still lasers. The structure still lasers. Yeah. This, this shows you how, how robust a pixel can be, basically, where you can trace some of the carriers and still uh, get lasing on them. But maybe this example uh, can be laid out uh, correct. Okay, so after you have done that, and you, you know all your tuning is correct, then you, you ramp up the voltage, you ramp up the current up to a, a value, a third value, and you look up. file, as I mentioned before, you put another stop in, you look up the big file and see where the gain changes from minus to plus, that's your transparency current, so as a starting current for your full simulation, you use this number. And I also have in, in the manual the standing wave file, that's an ASCII file for the standing wave, and this is a is an ASCII file for the round trip gain. It actually also tells you the reflectivity spectrum for each mirror, not only the total one, but also for each mirror, so you can evaluate each mirror separately. This.
Then, after all this is adjusted, you start the full 3D simulation up to a certain point. The photon scan is a scaling parameter to make it more stable. Uh, it, it somehow uh, scales the photon density. Um, there's some, some trick from Simon, which he can better explain than I do. Um, but normally, this is not important. So I have to drop this number. Uh, and then, in the longitudinal uh, part of the SOL file, we find numbers that are important for the longitudinal, uh, the vertical optical calculation, the transfer matrix. So here we have a reference wavelength again. We have a left reflectivity and a right reflectivity. And now we have to watch it. This is a reflectivity at the last interface. So between the last mirror layer and air, then you would have like 0 0.32. Or on the bottom side, between the last mirror layer and the substrate, then you would have like 0 0.01 or something, very low reflectivity. Yeah. So here you have to uh, take care a little bit of what number you use. So the reference index, the midpoint is where approximately at what position the center of, of the device is, the active region. Then you include all the dot .vixel information, the vixel section commands I showed you in the layer file, and then some optical uh, uh, parameters for the how many modes and so on. In vixels, we only have one mode, so it's not that critical in how many uh, 3D bias terms. That's it. So the SOL file can be as short as this, but uh, it, as I mentioned, it's often important to modify the active region setting, and you can actually do that here in the SOL file. Yeah, you don't have to go back to the gain file and modify active underlying region settings, because this gain file may be overwritten later if you, if, if you do something. I, 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 to keep it simple, I only edit the SOL file, and in the SOL file, you use the command set active region, and this will override anything, any settings for the active region. So you, you can put this, my SOL files are much longer than that, because here I put in all the active region settings that I mentioned before in the table. Okay, we're almost done. Not that bad. I still see the Oscars. So this is uh, some final results. This is a band diagram. You see the barrier is really too thick. It's thicker, much thicker than usual. Uh, 30 nanometers, is quantity of 10 nanometers. But otherwise, it looks reasonable. This is a comparison of the LI curve for the structure, the 1D structure that has no current spreading, and the 2D structure that does. So you see there's quite some difference. So the difference comes from that current spreading. And here you can now do plots of the uh, vector plots. This is a V plot. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you see this is just a bunch of triangles. And sometimes where there is no current density, where the current density is very low, you hardly see anything. But, but you, you basically get the picture. This is where the ring contact sits. So at this ring contact, the current comes in, and then the current spreads out. And so as the current density goes down, the, the triangles go down in size and disappear. This is a this is an envelope of the standing wave. So this is just the average of the standing waves, not the full standing wave. You can actually also plot the full standing wave. And this is a mode plot. This is a mode right at threshold. So you see the mode suppression is not that high, but here far above threshold, you have 40 dB mode cycle suppression. So, and that is the end of the tutorial. Do you have questions? They're too tired. Implantation of dopamine. 
then you have to define a region where you play with the mobility or with the, yeah, I would play with the mobility. You have an almost insulating region with a much lower mobility. Then you just define that region and put a much lower mobility into that material. Basically, you probably have to like take the original material, copy that, copy and paste, and call this material like algas implanted, and and play with all the parameters and, and read that in for your for the other column. Yes, yeah, for the other column. scale the, the pitch. Yeah. And can you also put grading of any function? I mean, right now, basically, you have square gate table. You, you can do sample grading structures. <coughs> so just grading, no grading, grading, no grading. Or you can do the linear scale of the grading pitch. These two things, nothing else, right? Other questions? Okay, then thank you very much for coming. See you. Just in case we have the same problem. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the world is developing very fast. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity of giving this talk this morning. As Joachim mentioned, I am in the Semiconductor Photonics Research department at a gear systems. We all have to learn to say a new name. This is formerly the microelectronics division of Lucent Technologies. We are presently a wholly owned subsidiary of Lucent Technologies, which those of you following the news you realize that Lucent very much wants to sell shares in that company is attempting to do so pretty much as we speak. Okay, so my role in that department is a technical manager. I have a device and materials physics group. That includes theory and simulation amongst other topics. And that's my personal background as well. I really think that this workshop is extremely timely. Those of you who were at OFC last week, I wasn't there, but the, the news was big crowds, 30,000 or plus, no paper towels in the bathroom, lots of excitement in the hallways. Look, our field continues to explode, okay? Communications revolution seems to be happening, and we all understand that it's not just in some simple sense, bigger and better, but this is really high-tech stuff. This is very complex technology. And in connection with that, simulation is really one of the key tools that's going to allow the industry to continue to develop at a very rapid rate. However, I think everybody in this room understands that effective use of simulation in our relatively immature field is very challenging. So one of the roles of a workshop like this is to try and identify what the issues are that make it hard to use simulation in our field 
and hopefully we'll ultimately come to some ideas of how to address those problems. When I was thinking about what to do with this talk today, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that we really were going to need a broad framework for discussion. So I've taken the liberty of really preparing almost completely a, a, a talk built around the broad issues in the field. Now, for those of you who lived through the maturation of the silicon technology in the associated TCAD environments, this is probably going to sound like old news. You're going to be sitting in the back kind of nodding and say, yep, we lived through that. Sure, yep. Well, all I can say in response is, I'm living it today. These are the issues that I actually wrestle with in my job on a day-to-day -day basis, trying to figure out how to allocate what are always limited resources to try and get a pretty diverse range of simulation and theory done on behalf of the gear systems. So I hope that the issues that I identify will be of some interest to you and will stimulate discussion. Even a little bit of controversy, that would be fine. That will build the workshop atmosphere that you were talking about. So what I propose to do today, I'm going to give a broad introduction, just a few view graphs to remind us all about what we're up to and what's driving our components industry. I'll then use that as a stepping off point to illustrate what I would regard some of the key simulation needs to be arriving at a condensed summary of what I think it is that we need, both from a technical point of view as well as from a software point of view. Having done that, I think it's worthwhile to try and stop for a few moments and ask, what's between us where we are now and a more integrated TCAT environment such as people in silicon are familiar to have with having? And then suggest some scenarios for how that might evolve. We are very actively involved in research in this area, but I don't believe I'm going to have time to address particular research topics that we work on right now. So, our colleagues in the silicon industry at this point have a very mature set of tools, typically integrated packages that span the range from pointer is to me. Or do you have one around the other? Any laser pointer or not? Sorry, my 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 broke down this point. Don't worry about it. I'll just use the old fashioned kind. There are integrated simulation tools that run the range from very microscopic simulations at the process level or microscopic treatment of physical devices, right through the generation of the compact models, and then on into circuit simulation. Okay? This is so important to the silicon industry that the necessary subsequent steps for the development of TCAD, technical Association Roadmap, which in the silicon industry really acts as a driving force for where the technology is going. Bottom line, I think it's fair to say that in the modern industry, it is simulate first and then fabricate. That's the way business is done in silicon. Well, needless to say, in our industry, that's not really true anymore. Or not true yet, pardon me. If you look back over historically, let's say, what has driven the development of components technology and communications, it's largely been the long haul network, the core backbone network over long distances. That has rapidly evolved in the last few years for very high uh, aggregate bit rate transmission. And that typical system would look something like this. On the transmit side, we're encoding signals on a variety of wavelengths that are multiplexed together. They go through relatively long fiber spans. The long fiber spans are enabled by fiber amplifiers with associated pump lasers. So this is a key technology as well and then he multiplexed and detected on the other side. Obviously, semiconductor component technologies, and in some cases, lithium niobate as well, as passive optical type of components are really critical to making this all happen. There's a very tight loop of rapid development in this field that's fueling the explosion of capacity. So typically what we're talking about is many wavelength channels at these days two and a half or 10 gigabits per second. For example, 80 wavelengths on 50 gigahertz spacings at two and a half gigahertz per second. As I said, the whole thing is driven by the self-consistent loop where there's more and more stringent requirements for the performance of the components that go in. And that's what drives us as component vendors. Higher optical power, higher speed, lower chirp components, and so on and so forth. At the same time, as the systems guys drive to more complex systems, that pushes back on us to try and generate more highly integrated components to more effectively manage that complexity. So these are some of the key drivers that come out of the long haul systems area. An example of a technology that has played an important role in that evolution 
is an integrated DFB laser with an electroabsorption modulator. This is actually the first mass produced indium phosphide based OEC, circa 1995. Okay. But many of you realize that research and prototype type activities in OEIC has been going on for a very long time. The point I want to make is that a relatively complex integrated chip like this really only became an important commercial force when the system market provided the drive, driving for that. The OEIC is the solution that provides both high extinction and low chirp for long haul applications. And that's what made this thing commercially important. Another key question in our industry is the rate and the way in which optical components or optical bandwidth are going to get pushed out to the end user. This is what I would call a telco-centric view of the world. It's not the only view, of course. It starts at the core with what I was already talking about, which is the long distance networks, and then cascades outwards with a ring-type architecture until you finally get to the end user. Now, don't worry about trying to decode all the little uh, boxes on here. That's not the point. The key point is that in order to push optical bandwidth out to the edge of the network, we as components vendors have to deliver performance at low cost. So that's another key driver in our industry. And it's this that's going to drive our industry to significantly higher volumes and all the things that are associated with that. Now, I stress that this is a telco-centric view. There is an IP-centric view, Internet Protocol Type Networks. It would look very different superficially. But the message is basically the same. When fiber is being in installed in metro areas, they're not pulling a few fibers, they're pulling bundles of fibers, sometimes with hundreds of fibers in the cable. In fact, there's more dark cable than lit up cable in the metro area. What's it waiting for? It's waiting, again, for components that will deliver the performance needed at the appropriate cost to put the end equipment into place. Okay, so this is another key driver for our industry. All right. None of this is really news. The industry associations try and capture these in roadmaps, but unlike the silicon industry, where the roadmaps really represent an aggressive set of targets that the industry drives the industry, I would say roadmaps in our industry are really more reflective of the status quo at a certain time. So the last OIEA roadmap was actually 98. We'll do for a new update this year. I don't want you to strain your eyeballs on this either. The point is that there are a few themes under there that are easy to extract. Okay, and that's what I think we need to focus on for today. The drive to higher volumes in manufacturing, the necessity of more integrated products, the necessity for the components to operate at higher speed, the necessity for higher optical output power from the components, and everything driving the very aggressive cost curves. So our friend, the integrated laser and modulator, which is kind of old technology to a certain extent, has become a workhorse on the one hand. It must ride aggressive cost curves to be used further and further out in the network, and in order to address these other issues, we're going to be looking at substantially more complicated items. So that's basically where we're going. How are we going to get there? We require natural advances in process capability, advanced characterization, materials, devices, processes, and concerning us here in the room today, process and device simulation. This environment is an opportunity for us, whether we be on the industrial R&D side, in the saw here as software vendors or involved in academic research that's pertinent to this field. Now, during the rest of my talk, it's going to sound like the only two parties I'm talking about are my side, the industry, and the software vendors on the other side. But I think we understand that the academic, our academic colleagues play a very important role in this and actually sort of find themselves on one or both sides of that because so many of them are starting companies or offering software or what have you. So I haven't forgotten about you, but you're, in fact, very important for everything I'm going to say. All right, going forward from here, that was kind of the big, big picture. What I want to do now is I've spent one view graph just outlining what are the simulation issues that underpin each of these big picture issues, namely integration, speed, power, and cost. Let me start with integration. I mentioned the complexity in the long haul network, an explosion of the number of wavelengths involved. One approach to that is to try and make devices that address more than one wavelength, potentially. The approach that we've done a fair amount of work on is a tunable yeah, discrete drag refractor laser, integrated in this case with an optical amplifier and an electroabsorption modulator. A two and a half gigabit version, this was announced at OFC last year. The 10 gigabit version was discussed at this year's OFC. From the 
the standpoint of discussion for us today, the key point is we needed to design this to be extremely stringent, high performance specs for both 10 and 2.5 and 10 gigabit long haul applications. And we exploited simulation in the process of doing that. It was essential for us to get this done. And it's easy for any of us who are familiar with the basics of laser operation to recognize what the, what's going on. For example, it's important to get into the details of tuning up the brag mirror so that the feedback <coughs> to the gain section is such that we maintain high, so high side mode suppression at the same time that we allow enough optical power to get through to feed the rest of the device. So traveling wave type simulations, similar to what you have in a DFB laser, are extremely important. And then you can go right on down through the list. And you can see that all of these things are pertinent. Mode propagation to deal with these transition regions, for example. The importance of being able to calculate the rate of tuning in the DVR mirror section. There are transport issues because these are all, of course, diodes. We do selective area growth as one of the platforms we use for making these devices and simulating that process is important. And then finally, things like RF issues that are involved in feedback in this chip or the importance of how much reflectivity we have at this facet and the impact on the chirp of this device. It's a rich and varied set of tools that we needed to actually work on this kind of an integrated device. We turn to high speed components. What we're talking about here at this point for R&D purposes is 40 gigabits and beyond. What's it going to take to get there? I think it's fair to say, mm, plus minus at 40, but we're not talking about just making a smaller lumped element that will operate at higher speed. We're going to have to do more complex things. So looking ahead, we're talking about an entire suite of components, detectors, modulators of various kinds, optical preamps to deal with noise issues at high speeds, um, and ultimately, the opportunity for making relatively integrated components that would do all optical processing <coughs> so-called 3 r regeneration. There we're talking about pieces like mode lock lasers or making something like an optical AND. This has been a very active area of research over the last several years, mostly done on an optical table with big fiber rings and fiber gratings and so on and so forth. But if it's going to be real, it's going to have to come in a little box, and that's where we come in. Okay. So, for example, we've been very actively working on the modulator side of this problem. This was presented in the post-deadline paper at OFC. It's an integrated card amplifier encoder configuration that's designed to take CW input, generate short pulses of more than five picoseconds, and then encode data on those pulses. You can see it's a non-trivial integrated device. That's what's needed to achieve the performance at 40 gigabits. As we start our research efforts in this area, and we're actively interested in a lot of this stuff, there's a lot of tough, interesting physics that we have to get right. Hot carrier effects for understanding detectors, and modulators operating at high speeds, electro-optic effects, obviously. When you get into making this optical AND, we have to figure out how we can turn amplifiers into nonlinear elements, optical amplifiers. Gain dynamics is important. We're talking about potential for travel and wave design, so the coupling of optical mode propagation and microwave propagation. Again, a very rich uh, and interesting area for simulation. And simulation will be critical here. It's an idea of the scale, the size scale of the devices you're talking about right now. This down here? We're talking ballpark uh, one to two millimeters. Power. The pump lasers, the power of the amplifiers, the optical amplifiers are one of the critical things for the networks. As I understand it, the market's advancing at about a factor of two every two years. If you can see it different, let me know. This is critical for EDFA design, urban dope fiber amplifier design, generally speaking, increasing length reach. And Raman amplification is really a hot area for the systems guys, but it's a real power hog. So we really have to be able to pump a lot of optical power into the right wavelengths to do that. Again, improving these devices requires a great deal of effort from the simulation point of view. Obviously, diode transfer uh, simulation, heat transport is important. There are a lot of issues related to optical modes. This you might imagine capturing at sort of a microscopic transport level. There are a lot of more phenomenologic issues that are also important, for example, related to displacement hole burning or filamentation, if you're talking about something like a flared amplifier type configuration. And then ultimately <coughs> optical feedback, and in particular optical coupling efficiency for packing issues, packaging issues. Last area I wanted to touch on is low cost applications, which is a stressed is very important for us. And I think the key message here is that low cost applications are really driven by modular cost, not chip cost. What that means is that in order to make a transmitter, which is typically operating at 2 and a half to 10 gigabits per second these days with an uncooled laser, that package cost being the driver may often
often mean that you'll actually take a more complex chip technology because it offers you cost savings at the module level. This has been the ongoing argument for vertical cavity lasers in the telephone market, for example, ease of packaging. Let's see it, that's what it's supposed to be about. Alternatively, since we're an engine bidding crowd, we start looking at things like spot size converters, which allow us to blow up the beam and ease the alignment issues, which can be a significant cost issue. Again, a more complex technology, so we can drive down package costs. From a simulation point of view, all the same tools are needed. I won't repeat them. I will stress that one of the things we do <coughs> we can do is exploit new materials. That's especially going on on the vertical cavity side. The other issue I want to stress is the yield issue, because the chips do have to have high yield to be low cost. And that brings a new dimension to the simulation problem. Well known to people in the silicon area. Using the simulation tools to assess the impact of process variation on the performance variations and understand yield issues and where the critical yield bits are going to come. Okay, so those were my four examples that I wanted to go through. Let me now try and distill this out into a set of simulation requirements. We start with the technical side. One of the things we learned both from these examples but also from conversations with our silicon TCAD colleagues is that it is essential to think about these physical models and simulation capabilities in a hierarchical fashion. We have need for the most microscopic aspects of the problem, process simulation, quantum models, details of carrier transport, heat transport, a variety of optical and microwave propagation tools. But these need to feed a higher level of simulation, phenomenological models of various kinds. It's something as simple as a rated wave model for a laser or a traveling wave model for a DFB laser, which is a little bit more complex, or something that can handle the intrinsically strongly coupled module level that we have in optical electronic components. One difference to electronics, and I'll come back to this, is that in optics, feedback really matters. We have to deal with the module at a strong, with strongly coupled models. For someone coming more from a materials background like myself, it's taken a long time to get this message pounded into my head. Things that are 10, 20, 30, 40 dB down in power matter. Okay. Finally, compact models generation is an ideal interface to system simulation. The complexity on the system side means the system guys are all simulating like crazy too. And some of the vendors involved in, in uh, component simulation are playing in this space as well. On top of this hierarchy, we have other issues, physical model verification, obviously, and the ability to do that statistical analysis or analysis or design of experiment type simulations. So that's on the technical side. What about on the software side? Well, from my point of view, it would be ideal if we could be doing this on a common platform. Same look and feel interface, common data structures allow ease of, trans, of, of moving data out of one simulation into another, ideally all inside a single interface. That's obviously not where we are right now. Uh, what I call seamless support of the model hierarchy that I just emphasized. A link to mask layout, especially for design engineers, is extremely valuable. These two things are almost motherhood. This item here, however, proprietary models, is an important issue, and I'm going to come back to it in a moment. On the industrial side, we are in the business of making models as well. We are as close as anybody, obviously, to the devices of interest to us. But we need the ability to take those models and get them plugged into a larger simulation framework. So something like this would be extremely valuable. The other message I want to <coughs> emphasize here is how does this look to the R&D engineer? You have to realize that a typical R&D engineer doesn't spend a very high fraction of their time using simulation tools. They can definitely benefit from them, but they cannot be experts in them. There must be a mode of use for these tools which is relatively casual, easy to pick up and put down. Use it for a few days in the first quarter of the year, Come back after you've made one or two turns in the process, maybe several months later, to reassess your data and reassess your design. There's an intermediate stage where someone's a heavier user of this and they need good interfaces, good data management. And then finally, there are advanced users, the people who make simulation for a living and they need full control. This entire dynamic range really needs to be addressed for the tools to be effective. We are active in a lot of the areas of the research associated with these uh, types of physical models. I'm not going to go into any details on that today. What I want to do now is turn to the, the question of what are the, I put it here on the geographic impediments, maybe I should have been more politically correct, it's the challenges. But there are a lot of challenges for getting to the point that I just described. And 
And I think there would be no argument in this room that we're anywhere as close to what I described at the present time. The first set of challenges relate to the diversity of uh, concepts, platforms, physical models. I've made kind of a list here. You can read it for yourself. We face a, a situation with a variety of device platforms. We do a lot of very heterostructure. A lot of people do bridge, vertical cavity. A wide range of types of devices, laser, modulator, and so on. 